Hello once again, George Nachik here. This is the video update to the uh, Electric Universe Challenge that I put out about 10 days ago regarding uh, finding errors in a paper uh, by a Morton Spheres on deriving the big G gravitational constant using first principles and purely from an electrostatics point of view. And in my challenge video, I told you that there are a number of errors in this paper, and some are very fatal errors. Now, uh, only one person responded over this past 10 days, uh, uh, one of my viewers from uh, Scandinavia, Ulf, and he uh, did allude to uh, one of the problems in the paper having to do with uh, the electron radius and in this video uh, I'm not going to provide a detailed analysis yet that's going to be a week from now I'm going to give you a little more time to um, uh, figure out what the errors are I'm going to point you now to the errors in the paper um, uh, it is by no means necessarily a comprehensive list, but it will uh, show you some of the more important errors that I found and some of the fatal errors uh, in particular. Um, so I'm going to point you to the errors and now it will be up to you to determine just why they are errors. And I will do a complete analysis on that in another week and upload that next Saturday. So hopefully some of you will uh, be able to explain the errors. Uh, keep in mind that this is what you will be doing uh, particularly for you students out there that are um, attending university currently. Uh, in your professional career you will be um, needing to stay abreast of uh, subject material in your field, uh, reading papers uh, from reputable journals and maybe not so reputable journals and you have to uh, make an assessment as to whether or not these papers are an error. You always need to critically read papers. Never ever take a paper at face value unless you have previously vetted the author out and have learned to grow to trust uh, a particular author or uh, someone who submits paper. For example, back in the 30s, uh, I, I, I wouldn't have necessarily uh, had to go through a fine tooth comb for anything uh, submitted by Einstein, for example, or you know, more recently uh, by Richard Feynman and uh, others. I mean, these people uh, um, uh, you you grow to know that they know what they're doing and can trust their work and that uh, will be the case with many other uh, authors out there that publish and of course if you're reading uh, papers from reputable journals like in my field uh, in electronics um, I would trust things that have been uh, vetted and peer-reviewed out of the IEEE, uh, that is the Institute of Electronic and Electrical Engineers. Uh, they have a very stringent peer review process, so any papers that make it through the peer review and get published in um, the transactions or the appropriate um, uh, journal under the IEEE, you're probably going to be able to trust that paper. And the same thing with the Journal of Applied Physics and Applied Chemistry and other uh, reputable journals within uh, respective fields. Um, then there are uh, publishers out there that aren't quite so reputable, like uh, this Galilean Electrodynamics publication. Um, they apparently do peer review uh, by Electric Universe people and if that's the case then I can say that I could never trust anything 
being peer-reviewed by uh, the Electric Universe people because if they let this paper through and then there's another paper by a um, um, uh, person by the name of Ashcroft that submitted a paper regarding uh, redshift of light through plasmas that I'll be critiquing after this paper. Um, uh, these two papers having made it through tells me that uh, this particular uh, publication, uh, Galilean uh, Electrodynamics, is uh, just a crap organization that uh, made up of uh, people that really don't understand electromagnetic theory. So, anyway, let's get started. I'm going to point you now to the errors in Morton Sphere's paper, which is titled, An Electrostatic Solution for the gravity force and the value of big G. All right, like my previous video, which issued the challenge to find errors in uh, this paper submitted by Morton Spheres, here it is an electrostatic solution for the gravity force and the value of G, or is commonly referred to as big G. Uh, this paper was submitted by his daughter after uh, Mr. Sphere's death, and uh, apparently uh, his daughter is, at this time, was in the Department of Economics, and also, I, I believe, has some electronics background um, so uh, she she also made some uh, comments in this paper to clarify a few things but uh, nonetheless um, this is Morton Sphere's paper and I'm now going to direct you to the particular errors now here is the diagram that Mr. Sphere's is using to uh, illustrate the capacitances. Uh, what we have are two atoms of hydrogen. Uh, the proton or the nucleus of the um, uh, hydrogen atoms are the uh, two red spheres shown there. And then in yellow, I'm showing, highlighting uh, the charges uh, on this particular, uh, this item number three is the um, hydrogen uh, atom nucleus and it has a charge of uh, plus QP, meaning uh, the charge is positive on the proton, which is the nucleus of that particular hydrogen atom. And then here we have um, sphere number one, which is an electron associated with that particular proton and it has a charge of minus E and then up over here we have the other hydrogen uh, nucleus or proton and its associated electron and then there's some capacitances defined. The capacitance that's um, of importance in this paper is C12. This is the capacitance from the electron that's bound to the nucleus, uh, sphere number three, the capacitance between that electron and the electron attached to the other hydrogen atom. And these hydrogen atoms are assumed to be uh, one meter apart, or at least the uh, electrons are. Now, I don't have any problems with the uh, diagram. Uh, that's just to show you uh, uh, the basis of the paper on things to reference and what uh, Spheres is indicating here in the introduction is that with the introduction of electrostatic equations for finding the capacitance force between two electrons um, that um, this diagram is depicting two electrons positioned in separate hydrogen atoms which are spaced one meter apart as I uh, uh, told you. 
So that's in page one. Uh, there are no errors in page one. It's just an introduction giving a definition of terms. Now we go to um, the next page. This is uh, what I call page one is actually page 23 of this issue, this March April issue in the Galilean Electrodynamics. And now we're going to go over to page uh, 24, right here, the next page. And this is where we can start finding errors. Now, up near the top, uh, he's talking about uh, defining some forces. And after substituting known values into his equation, uh, force equations, uh, he finds that the gravitational constant, which he um, uh, derived, which he calls G sub E, as uh, opposed to the uh, gravitational constant that's experimentally determined and is uh, used in the Newtonian uh, force equation, <clears throat> we have that when he substitutes values in, he gets this value, uh, 6.6854, and um, that should be an immediate red flag. Uh, he, he, he says that the gravitational constant that he's using that's empirically derived is minus 6.67259, but the actual current value that's been determined to within 22 parts per million is 6.67430 times 10 to the minus 11th. That's uh, one part out of 44,000, or 22 parts per million. Uh, and I haven't checked at the time that this paper was written, I'm, I'm sure that that was not the um, accepted value for big G. I don't know where he came up with that, but that's uh, considerably far off from the value that we use today. See, we have 6.674, and he says it's 6.672, and that's two out of uh, roughly a thousand or uh, two tenths of a percent. And that's a huge discrepancy. Uh, he says here, note that the two numerical magnitudes for G and G sub E, which he derives, agree within 0.2 percent. And then goes on to say, because of this close agreement, F of G E with almost certainty or almost certain probability is the actual gravitational force between two electrons. Well, now that's ridiculous. Uh, you would expect if you're de uh, defining or deriving a value for big G out of first principles that you're going to come in a lot closer than 0.2 percent to the uh, measured value. Uh, this should be an immediate red flag that you know, all is not well here in paradise. Uh, that uh, you would expect to be much closer uh, in agreement than this. And to make a statement because of the close agreement, he calls 0.2% close. And with almost certain probability is the actual gravitational force um, or the, gravi uh, the gravitational constant. Now, that, that's a pretty bold statement to make, but never mind that. Uh, here is the first really big error. This is the fatal error. It says to convert the expression for the capacitance uh, for the special case F of GE, that's a force uh, between two electrons, the gravity force between two electrons to a general case expression for F of G where it's the gravitational force between any two massive bodies. So he first derives the gravitational force 
between two electrons and then uh, creates this uh, fudge factor A that takes it from the gravitational force between two electrons to the gravitational force between any two general masses. So this A is the ratio of the capacitance between bodies one and two, two general bodies, massive bodies, to the capacitance between two electrons with the same spacing and the same permittivity of space between them. So what he's doing here, A is just simply the ratio of two capacitances. It's the capacitance that you're going to have between two spheres of general mass as ratio to two spheres uh, of electrons or two electrons with the same spacing. So if you had two masses, M1 and M2, and you replaced them with two electrons, then the ratio of the capacitances between the two original masses that you started with ratio to um, two electrons with the same spacing that defines A. This is a problem. A, this equation for A is wrong. Up to you to figure out why it's wrong. Um, so he's saying, all right, F of G, that is the force between two general masses, is equal to FGE times A, where FGE is a force between two electrons, and then you have this fudge factor to take the force from two electrons to two general masses. And this equation here is wrong, because A is wrong. So figure that one out where R1 and R2 terms represent the effective radius of bodies 1 and 2 and the effective radius of an electron. And I'll get to that uh, in a bit about the radius, classical radius of an electron. Now, he gives a very detailed mathematical analysis shown on pages 38 to 40 of reference 2. Well, reference 2 is he, he has two books on the electrostatic gravity uh, called Gravity 1 and Gravity 2 and Reference 2 refers to the second book. I have links in the um, previous challenge video and I'll put these same links uh, to PDFs in that so that you have those to refer to. This paper is more or less kind of a summary of what you find in those books. And the, the books are not very, um, partic are particularly easy to read. But, um, and, and you really don't need them for uh, figuring out what's going on here. All right, second error. Here we've got these ratios. You need to look at these critically and figure out what these mean. He's going that the ratio of body one to the radius of an electron is to the capacitance of that body to the electron as the mass of that body is to the mass of the electron and then that the ratio of the radius of body sphere number two this is a general mass is to the radius of an electron as the capacitance of that body is to the capacitance of the electron and as the mass of that body is to the mass of the electron. Now, what are these C ratios? What these are, are the um, uh, ratios of the isolated capacitance to the background. Um, and, and, and that's fine. That, that's a valid thing to do to ratio to find uh, capacitances. But uh, you need to look at these uh, three ratios and look at that critically and think about it. And if these ratios are accurate, as he stated, then indeed A will work out to this value. A is the product of the masses of two general bodies to the mass of an electron squared. That is, mass 1 is to ma the mass of the electron times mass 2 is to the mass of an electron. And you end up with this equation, M1, M2 over m e or the mass of an electron squared and i say that this is wrong a 
will not work out to that value. You need to think about that and why my claim uh, is valid in saying that this is the wrong expression for A. Now, let's read a little further. Okay, now let's go to uh, page 25 here, the uh, third page that I wanted you to look at. He has some rather strange terminology that I've never ever seen anywhere before. Under basic approach, he talks about the electrical energy stored between the two poles of a capacitor having this value of capacitance. Well, the value is correct, but what he's referring to as poles in the uh, industry, we talk about that as being plates of a capacitor. Capacitor is two conductors separated by a dielectric, and we refer to those conductors as plates, not poles. I've never seen this terminology used anywhere except in this paper. So wherever he's talking about the poles of a capacitor, he's really talking about the plates. And the energy stored in a capacitor can be written this way. If you remember that the energy stored in a capacitor is one half C V squared, and also the relationship between charge, voltage, and capacitance is that charge is equal to the product of C V. So you can manipulate the equations to put them to eliminate V, the voltage out, and it ends up being uh, one half. Q squared divided by C is the energy stored in a capacitor. So nothing wrong with that. He's talking about a voltage gradient here. The voltage gradient between um, two electrons or two spherical masses. Um, the uh, V over R ratio that the uh, potential field or the voltage uh, varies um, in a um, manner of 1 over R um, uh, between uh, the spheres, and this is, this is correct for a sphere, is the uh, voltage uh, out from infinity as you move in towards a sphere varies is, uh, inversely in a linear relationship. So there's nothing wrong with that. That's okay. And now He's talking more about this gradient here, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, the um, important thing here is he says that <clears throat> the two electrons for the model calculation are assumed to be positioned in hydrogen atoms. This is what his assumption was and which his first diagram depicts. And here he's talking about place plate spacing, okay? He's calling it the pole to pole length, but what that is is the place space, plate spacing between the uh, conductors, <coughs> between the two conductors that make up the capacitor. In this case it happens to be two spheres. Now let's go to the top of the page. <coughs> and again this expression is correct that the uh, force between the um, electrostatic uh, force between uh, the plates uh, in a physical system of capacitances, uh, that force again is a product of charge times the electric field. The electric field is uh, the voltage gradient V over 2R and then by making the substitution in for E, you have force equals QV over 2R. So nothing wrong with that. But then he talks about here the force FGE, that's the force between the two electrons, the gravitational force, um, has a magnitude of a gravitational force and is therefore to be assumed to be uh, one is derived from the electrostatic definitions and relationships. Okay, This is the one that he's uh, been deriving and derives in this paper using figure one. And again, the important capacitance is C12. That calculation of that capacitance, you need to pay attention to that. 
Okay, so re moving on down, um, he's talking about this number A, which I say is a fatal error in this paper. It is uh, a pure number, sometimes I just call it a constant, it's not constant in that it doesn't vary, it's just constant in the term of, ter that the units drop out because you're ratioing two capacitance and it's a pure number, a unitless number that means. Uh, but A is wrong. Um, but this is the relationship to get the force between two general masses or any two bodies. It's the force between two electrons times this correction factor A and this is what you end up with in his, uh, with his equations right here. And here's the equation for A and it reduces to the product of the masses of these two general bodies to the masses of an electron. That is m1 to the mass of the electron times m2 to the mass of the electron. That's why you get mass of the electron squared in the denominator. This is wrong. Again, this is the fatal error in the paper. Constant A. Or the unitless number, this pure number A is wrong and you need to figure out why it's wrong. So K and A are pure numbers that remain invariant to the units applied in the expressions. That's true. Now here's another big error. What I was talking about before. Effective radius. This is the effective radius assigned to an object as if it were a pure conducting sphere that permits one to determine precisely the capacitance of the object to another or to the background space around it. Okay, This is extremely important in order to um, determine what the capacitance of a isolated sphere is or between two spherical objects you have to determine, you have to have an effective radius assigned to it. Okay, And again, he's assuming that the electron and the nucleus are perfect conducting spheres. This is his model for the uh, hydrogen atom, that the electron is a perfect conducting sphere. Very important. Now, for example, okay, go up to the top of the next page. Page 26, C12, here it shows up again. C12 between two objects, 1 and 2, spaced a great distance, R12, between their centers, is this value. You need to look at that, because that's critical in determining A. If A is wrong, it might be that this is wrong. I'm not going to tell you yet what the problem is, but you need to look at that. R1 and R2 are the effective radii, radii of objects 1 and 2 respectively. And E12 is a permittivity of the intervening space between the two objects. That's, that's fine. No, no problem with epsilon 1, 2. If it's free space, then epsilon 1, 2 is epsilon 0, which is the free space value, or permittivity of free space, which is 8.854 picofarads per meter, or 8.854 times 10 to the uh, minus 12th farads per meter. So uh, no problem with permittivity, but you really need to look at this capacitance ratio that he uses in calculating A. Now, these two statements are okay. He's just talking about how system energy effective radius or effective masses uh, reduce or lower when you bring other objects uh, into the system. If you have an isolated mass and um, then bring another mass uh, in its present, the total system mass uh, is lowered a bit. Um, and the same thing with uh, energy in a system. Uh, nature always tries to assemble things to a lowest energy state. And so if you have 
two isolated systems and add up their energies and then bring them in close proximity to one another, you'll find that the total system energy is a bit lower than the energy of the individual parts. And he's basically saying, what he's saying here is that if you have two masses, and you sum its constituent parts, that is the electrons, neutrons, and electrons, and if you take all the masses, the rest masses of these three particles, and sum them up, and then look at the total mass of the assembled atom, uh, the element atom, you will find that the total mass is a little bit less than the mass of the constituent parts. And that is because some of the mass is lost into forming bonds between the electrons um, and the uh, protons and the nucleus. Uh, this is what we refer to as binding energy. That some of the mass in assembling an atom is lost in binding that atom together. For example, if you uh, say had a uh, oxygen atom, oxygen is element number eight, has the eight protons, uh, about as many neutrons, and eight electrons. If you were to take the isolated rest masses of the eight protons and the weight or masses of the eight protons and the masses of the neutrons and added the masses of the rest masses of the electrons and then go to a periodic table and look at the atomic mass or the atomic weight for oxygen you'll find it's a little bit less and that's because some of the energy goes into uh, bonding and uh, putting it together the um, strong and weak nuclear forces and what um, the amount of energy uh, that goes in uh, is equal, you can get it through E equals mc squared, the famous uh, mass energy equivalence that Einstein came up with. So that's all he's talking about here and he's just assuming he can neglect the binding energy and I don't take too much issue with that. If you were to actually account for the mass loss in the nuclear binding energy that would not account for the 0.2% that he is off in calculating G from its uh, current uh, accepted value that has been uh, empirically measured. Uh, so he's just saying here, let's assume that the mass of uh, an atom is actually equal to the mass of the uh, constituent parts when they're isolated. That's all he's telling you here. So, again, here we have a problem, is you need to look at these ratios. He's saying that uh, for mass ratios of a uh, capacitance to the total capacitance is to the radius, to the uh, radius of the system as to the mass is to the mass of the system. And here is part of the problem. You need to look at these ratios. There's a problem here. So for the proton to electron ratio, he's telling you that the isolated capacitance, that is the capacitance from infinity to a isolated proton is to the capacitance <coughs> from infinity to an isolated electron is equal to the effective radius of a proton to the effective radius of the electron as to the mass of the proton is to the mass of the electron and we do know uh, the values for the mass of the electron and the mass of the proton quite accurately and this value is correct that the proton is more massive than the electron by a factor of 1836.15 um, that is not the problem but there is a problem in these ratios and for any electron, for any object to electron ratio, he's making this statement. And again, you need to look at that. There's a real problem here. That the capacitance of any massive object 
to the capacitance of an electron is going to be the same as the radius of the sphere, of a general sphere, mass, a mass that's assumed to be spherical, is to the effective radius of the electron as the mass of a general uh, mass that's constructed in a sphere is to the mass of the electron. You need to look at that ratio. There's a real problem there. Now, <clears throat> let's go up to the top of the paper here, of this last page. As um, he's referring to chapters five and six, in reference to reference to is his second book on gravitation, uh, electrostatic gravitation. Um, if you want to get a more detailed discussion of the capacitances and effective radii and the masses used for his electrostatic determination of gravity. Um, uh, if, if you want to um, dig a little more deeper into that as to how he comes up with these ratios, you can go there and look. But you can just look at the ratios at face value and find the problem. Okay. Now, again, very significant, he tells you the most important radius used in this paper and for the basis of determining the electrostatic gravity force is the effective radius of the electron. This is huge and this is a problem. You need to figure out why this is a problem. You need to understand what the effective radius of an electron is and what it represents. So, and this is calculated, he's correct here where he says the total energy of an electron is given um, by this value, uh, the charge of the electron squared divided by the isolated capacitance of the electron is equal to mc squared. And this is a standard thing you do for finding the effective radius of an electron is you equate its rest energy from uh, the mass energy equivalence uh, principle that Einstein uh, established that E equals mc squared. So you take the rest mass of the electron, multiply it by the speed of light squared, and you set it equal to the energy stored in the capacitance of the electron. <coughs> and then you can get the effective radius of the electron. Not a problem there. That's a standard thing to do and the effective radius of the electron is 2.81795 times 10 to the minus 15 meters. So that's about one ten thousandth of an angstrom. An angstrom is 10 to the minus 11th meters. So very, very tiny, but you need to understand what that effective radius means and can he use it in this paper. Very important. Now this statement here, don't have a problem with, is he's uh, just uh, telling us that his model is uh, using uh, two hydrogen atoms spaced one meter apart and that there would be a voltage gradient uh, appearing between the uh, two atoms and that's true. Is, uh, the electric field is minus uh, the, the voltage gradient it, uh, or minus the uh, gradient of a potential field. That's the standard way that we define um, uh, um, an electric field and potential. Potential is a scalar field and by taking the gradient, the minus gradient of it, you get what the electric field is. And all he's doing is just telling you that the voltage between the plates of the capacitor divided by the um, separation distance gives you the gradient, and that's what he uses. And there isn't a problem here that in point 0.5 that the proof of the um, energy or the force in this case between the two electrons or two bodies is just product of uh, charge and voltage divided by the separation that comes about from this that force is equal electrostatic force is the 
uh, charge in electric field, so the charge times the electric field, and the electric field in this case is the gradient, which is V over R, so force is equal to Q times V over R. That's just a statement that is uh, charge times the electric field. Not a problem with that. So, I don't need to go any further. Um, these four pages are sufficient. There's many errors that I just pointed out. It's up to you now to figure out why those errors are significant. And you have until next Saturday to uh, post your ideas on this. And a week from today, I will uh, make a video detailing all the problems that I pointed out in the various aspects on these four pages. And in particular, again, that the um, uh, unitless number, the, what he calls the uh, pure number A, is the real critical flaw in this paper. Uh, not to mention all of these other flaws that uh, I pointed out. You need to look at the effective radius of the electron. You need to look at these ratios of capacitance to effective radii to the uh, masses of objects to the electron or um, and, and vice versa. So there you have it. Uh, please post your comments and uh, let me know uh, what you've come out, up with to figure out uh, why indeed there are these errors that I pointed out and what the errors are, why, well, what spheres did wrong here to create these uh, errors. And of course, uh, just because A is a fatal error just makes the conclusions of this paper totally wrong. This is just I, again, I'm, I'm still thinking this is some sort of an April Fool's joke, but if it's not, then uh, Spheres has uh, kitted himself and deluded himself into thinking that he is something significant here, when indeed it's just nothing but a pile of crap. Anyway, there you are. Good luck.